Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to this webinar. If you could please turn your microphone off uh, until a bit later. Um, we'll wait a couple of minutes more in case other, any more people join us at the beginning. Uh, and then we'll start. Maybe um, there are people here from multiple countries, and it's great to have you participate. Um, maybe we should begin. Um, my name is Morgan Carpenter. I'm the Executive Director of Intersex Human Rights Australia. And this session today, this webinar, is with Marnie Mitchell, Marnie Bruce Mitchell, who until the end of this month is the, the Executive Director of uh, ITANS, um, Intersex Trust Otorara, New Zealand. Um, and today will be a, 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 a dialogue about community and, and about life events, really. Um, and before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that those of us in Australia and everybody in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're on Indigenous land. And in Australia, where I'm located, um, that land has never been ceded. Uh, and there is a huge amount of unfinished business uh, to do uh, to ensure that, that, in, that Indigenous peoples of these lands have voice, treaty and access to truth. Um, please feel free to acknowledge the land that you're joining us from, uh, perhaps using the chat function. Uh, and it's an opportunity also to introduce yourselves to other people here as well, if you wish. Um, but if I can, I would like to um, introduce Marnie. Would you like to say hello, Marnie, for people that have not met you? Sure, Morgan, um, and thank you for that introduction. So yes, hello to everyone from Aotearoa. Um, I'm here in Honaki. Whanganui Atara, so um, the land here slightly different from Australia. We, the Indigenous people, have a treaty with the Crown, and the Crown hasn't really done a very good job around that. So, like Australia, we have a lot of work to do healing. Um, it's a blessing and a privilege to be here tonight and as it was my birthday um, on the 10th I'm sort of here as a person who is nearly 70 so I'm very happy to hold an elders talking stick tonight. Also my mum screaming out that I was a hermaphrodite so that's as far as we got. Um, yeah, um, just looking at your bio as well, you underwent a number of surgeries as a child mm -hmm. and uh, you describe how you took your first, you made, you made your first act of defiance when you were an adolescent, when you refused to be examined by a doctor. 
and you describe that as a very long, slow journey to reclaim your own body. Um, and after you left school, you trained as a teacher. I did. Um, and then worked in disaster management, which is very topical today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then retrained as a counselor and psychotherapist. So you've had a long um, kind of work history focused on focusing on personal and uh, social and economic disasters uh, and uh, healing. Um, and, and you've also been on your own journey, your own healing journey as someone with an intersex variation as well. Um, you participated in the first ever retreat for intersex people. All right, so we'll hit pause there and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So yeah. I reached adulthood what I would now know as somebody who had completely cut off from emotions. So there's various ways you can talk about it, the dissociative process, but I was an expert at it. So I, I did, I, I trained as um, a teacher. Now it's really hard to know now, but in those days I was unbearably shy. So I'd grown up in remote rural New Zealand then we'd shifted to a provincial town city, but I was incredibly shy and confident in, in sports things, but not at all confident around other people. So I, I went to high school, I passed a qualification and applied for and, and went to teachers college. So I went out with my mum and dad. So here's this shy country kid, you know, and, and there were two lines and I stood in one line. So I'm probably the only person talking tonight who accidentally went to university. Because when I got to the end of this line, it was for university, not for teachers college. And at this particular institution, there was a combined qualification. And I was too embarrassed and too shy to say I was in the wrong line. So I, I enrolled. So it was a beautiful mistake because um, I'd been told that I was stupid and that I was dumb and I didn't know how to do things. And again, that's trauma. Um, but it university and teachers college I found out that I wasn't dumb and I wasn't stupid and I had some amazing tutors so again that's another powerful part of the journey so I, I trained as a teacher I did all my teacher um, in, in remote rural areas because it was impossible to get permanent work so I went overseas for a couple of years, and that's a whole nother experience. Um, like lots of people in that era, I went overland from India in an old truck, and we drove literally from India to London. Um, as I look back now, what an extraordinary trip, because nobody would be able to do that today. Um, again, it was an experience that opened my eyes to culture, to difference, um, very powerful experience. Came back to New Zealand and I'm still trying to work out who I am, what I am. I figured out that I was a lesbian. Um, rang up and told my parents because I was pretty excited. They were absolutely devastated. And it's only in later years that I came to see that, you know, all the things that happened to me and to happen to most of us from the medical model were done to make us normal. And in that setting, being normal meant heterosexual. So you know, my parents had had to pay money for the surgeries that I'd had. And so they had invest, invested a huge amount in my heteronormativity. And here I was ringing up excited, telling them that I was a lesbian. Um, it had a very sad repercussion because not long after that, my dad died very suddenly. And my mum would turn around and say that I killed him, that it was the shock of me coming out as a lesbian, 
that um, caused him to die. So, you know, we have in our narrative stories these extraordinary overlapping places. So you're absolutely right, Morgan. The, the, my own journey of healing um, was late in coming, <laughs> was complex and had lots of bits to it. And I'm sharing that because one of the things that I want to leave us all with tonight is that sense of hope, that it doesn't matter how shitty and how awful and how dark our stories are, if we want to we can walk out of those places, we can find amazing people, and, and we can um, live lives with joy and hope and colour and dance in them. So I was unemployed as um, a teacher, I couldn't find permanent work. And it, it was in an era when we, if you were unemployed, you got offered a job and if you didn't take it, you would lose the dog. So I was offered two jobs, one working for the boys brigade, and I knew absolutely that was not going to work for me. And the other one was working in civil defense, which I didn't know anything about, but I thought, well, it's not boys brigade, so I'll go for the civil defense one. And I went into that job um, to develop a resource kit to go into schools. Um, and the person who was in charge in civil defense in New Zealand at the time saw my work, liked what I was doing because it was just a temporary job. And he arranged for me to um, be funded permanently. His name was Wooda Gardner and he's actually just recently passed. So acknowledge this um, amazing man that I guess spotted some talent. So I would go on to work for 18 years in civil defense and work my way up until I was manager of civil defense in the Wellington region. So in charge of disaster preparedness for the capital city of New Zealand. So a very unusual trajectory in there. I did a lot of my training in Australia at Mount Macedon, the um, college out of Melbourne. And it was during those years that I learned about a process called critical incident stress management. So it's how emergency service people look after each other. And if I look at it now, and we're going back a long time, nearly 40 years ago, it was a very holistic model. And it realized that for people to, and this is a paradox, it was all about money, for people to perform well in disasters, they needed balanced lives. Like if they had good relationships, if they've been taking care of their own bodies, um, you know, they were fit and healthy, there was a much better chance that they would come through disasters and be still performing at the end of it. This is a model that was started by a man called um, Jeffrey Mitchell. So my initial interest in disaster and PTSD and what disasters do was me looking out for my own staff because I had several staff go away to disasters and come back changed. I had no idea that had anything to do with me. It was me looking after my own staff. So my change moment, I was sent to San Francisco after the Loma Prieta earthquake. I was sent up as part of the observation team. We, I was in a, the first aeroplane to land at San Francisco airport after it opened. And it was oh. like running down a railway track, bump, 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 down all the cracks down the runway. Um, and we were part of an official team and went to the area down in the marina where lots of um, buildings had collapsed. There were still um, bodies trapped in those collapsed buildings. But because we were part of the international team, there was a double police cordon around it. So this is a long-winded story, but this is important. Got through the first cordon and we were just about to go in. So if you can imagine, there are police officers standing, not shoulder to shoulder, about 10 meters apart. So we went up to one of the police and there was a huge helicopter flying in the air. And I would later find out the helicopter had the pre president, the, the then president of America in it. And so they gave an order and the order was sealed the cordon. And so this police officer went into a crouch, pulled out his revolver and held it in my face. 
I mean, he was sealing the cordon, he was just doing. So I'm eyeballing this cop with a revolver in my face. I'd grown up on a farm, so I was used to firearms, but not, not small arms. We don't have small arms in New Zealand. So he looked at me, I looked at him and he said, what, something like, what the fuck are you doing here? And I, in those days, I was potty mouthed and as strong as any of the emergency service guys. And I, so I said something and he looked at me and he said, get your ass in there. So he let me in. And so, and I went. Now, in the days that followed, I started feeling what I now know are emotions. And I thought I was being affected by the earthquake. And I was pissed because I thought I was as tough as any of the guys. So if there was a dangerous place to go, I went. If there was somewhere awful, I, I went to it. I was trying to prove to myself that I wasn't affected, but something was going on. So it would become several years later, I realized that that armor that I'd placed over myself as a child, and it was really thick, had cracked. And it would take me um, a, a lot of work to figure that out. I was actively suicidal. Um, and I burned out in my job, I didn't collapse mentally, but my physical body collapsed. So Morgan, I just turned um, 40. And I had the extraordinary luck to be introduced to a brilliant general practitioner. And her name was Hetty Rodenberg. And Hetty had been trained by the renowned Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was one of the first clinicians in the world to develop healing programs for people with PTSD. She developed the program to support veterans from Vietnam. And I would go off and do 13 of those workshops. Um, and that's really where my healing, but also a framework, because up until then, what I realized, I'd just been a person that could put masks on. I didn't know who I was. I had no ethical framework. I had no sense of self at all. And it's through those workshops that I slowly start to um, develop the framework and also got brave enough to introduce this word hermaphrodite which I still didn't know what it meant so you know it's not till I turn 40 so any of you out there who are listening you know this is too hard what am I going to do how am I going to get my life together it can happen and sometimes it doesn't happen until we're much older so sorry, I've been talking for a while, but that's a kind of nutshell version of something incredibly complicated. And um, there's a book coming, by the way, so you'll get this in detail in about a year's time. <laughs> okay, that's great to know, because I'm, I'm I, yeah, the, I, I want to hear this, and I, and I hope other people maybe hearing the personal stories that people have, particularly the elders in our community, I think is so rich uh, and important for people to be aware of because um you know Mani, what you've described so far is this journey of healing and coming to understand that you have emotion but then did you you also find the word hermaphrodite then when did you find the word intersex and when did you get connected to people yeah well it US? wasn't it wasn't till i went to see that doctor so um <laughs> I went in with the word hermaphrodite and she, I, I, I think we only used the word hermaphrodite during that session. So, you know, most doctors, you, you have a what, 10 minute session when you go. That doctor, the first time I went in, saw me for an hour and a half. When I came out, her waiting room was bursting with people, you know, who, were way overdue for her appointment and I had the beautiful luck of finding an empathetic kind generous doctor who didn't really know what my situation was didn't know anything about intersex but she then went to the um, medical library and I still don't know she probably stole the book rather than borrowed it because I don't think you can take books out of the medical library so my first introduction to intersex was 
a highly pathologized medical textbook, which is a pretty weird way to learn about yourself and your community. So I had the two things. One, oh my God, there's other people like me. But my first introduction to people like me were photographs of naked people with their eyes blacked out. So, you know, another thing to think about those of us who are older, there were no stories, there were no words, you know, there wasn't an image of reflection. So I'm very aware of the importance of this narrative because you know, history had me at the beginning when we were just starting to unfold, you know, who we were, what we were and start that narrative beyond the pathologized narrative inside medical textbooks. So did you, how did you come across Beau Laurent and his now? Yeah, so I have told you that I, I'm in, um, in civil defense. So I used to go to the New Zealand college and in those days there were, this is, makes me laugh now, there were very few women who were involved, it was mostly men. So th th this particular course I was on, the only other woman on the course, um, we shared a room together and it turned out this woman, Jenny Rowan, who was very high up in her own local council, she was the mayor. Um, we, we got to know each other and I told her as much as I could because I was very clumsy telling the story then. So Jenny um, would go on and, and go to America to do, um, to attend a, a course and, and it was um, feminist studies of some kind. And it just so happened that Bo gave a talk and my friend Jenny went, I think this person called Bo is talking about the same thing that Mani's been trying to talk to me about. And of course, in that era, I wasn't Mani, I was still Margaret. And so um, my friend got Bo's contact details and brought them back here to New Zealand. And I sent off, and it was a letter <laughs> in those days, an old school letter. And that's how I contacted Bo Laurent of Isna. And it was Bo that sent me the, an invitation to the first retreat. So can you tell us about that retreat? It's the, it was your first time meeting other people with some lived experience. Yeah, so um, by then I'd left the regional council. I had a, um, a small payout. So that was the money that I used to buy my aeroplane ticket. I can remember there were only a handful of people that knew where I was going and what I was doing. Um, my counsellor, my doctor, and then one person I'd got to know in the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross workshops. I can remember I was both excited and terrified and probably almost at the end of my rope. I, I don't know how much longer I could have held it together without meeting other intersex people. So at that point in time, I was still um, actively suicidal. So climbed on an airplane, went to America. Um, Suji was the person who met me at the airport. In that era, there were no security. Suji was just waiting there, you know, literally at not the gate, you know, when you come out of the airplane. And we walked together down to the luggage carousel and Suji's so yoke was just parked out in the parking lot. So San Francisco Airport was a fraction of the size that it is now. And that first retreat, um, Suji and Anne were living in a community house where that there would have been 15, 20 people, I think, living there. So, you know, that, that was a new experience for me. So at that first retreat, I was the only non-American person and there were actually nine intersex people. I know the film Hermaphrodite Speak um, doesn't have 10 people in it because not everybody at the retreat was comfortable to be on camera. So, and again, you know, we go back 
and and Bo was going, oh no, this will never be shown in public. We, we're going to put it in an archive. It'll be something, you know, that will be hidden. And we all went, oh, okay. So that's no one will ever see this. And then when she showed it to somebody who was doing going to do some editing, they said to Bo, this is absolutely incredible. This needs to be shown to the world. And so I can remember Bo contacting or contacted all of us to see whether or not we would give permission. You know, and peer pressure is an amazing thing. And none of us said no. And so Hermaphrodite Speak went into a film festival in San Francisco. And as far as I know, that's the first time that a narrative story is told in a picture framework outside of a medical um, construction. So that's not, the film I think first showed in 1997, that retreat was in 1996. And you can, you can see Hermaphrodites um, speak. That was the little documentary that it was, what it was called. And I think it's easily available online. It's not very long. It's about 35 minutes, I think. Yep, I've just shared the link in chat. It's, uh, it's, in, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, to put into words, like here I am, I'm meeting other intersex people for the first time and, if you know Bo, Bo is a very organized, very cognitive person. So it's like, right, we've got to organize as intersex activists and we've got to change the world. And we went, oh yeah, there, of course, that's what we're doing. So we didn't even share stories or do any of that. It was like, oh yeah, we're going to change the world. What do we need to do? Until the second to last night when there was a um, spa pool outside the place we were staying and Bo said right we're going to have um, a spa bath tonight and we'll all take our clothes off and everyone went yeah sure I had never had my clothes off around adults ever you know my own shame around my own body like but peer pressure again yep we all did that so we all go out and stand, get into the spa, none of us with our clothes on. And then you know, we'd been sitting for quite a while and Bo went, okay, now we're all going to get out and show each other our genitals. <laughs> and again, you know, we did. And that's when the healing started because we did it one by one. We sat on a bed and we showed and for most of us it's the first time we'd ever done that to a non-medical person and people were crying we were hugging each other some of the people had grotesque horribly deformed bodies from just the most appalling surgeries that had happened to them and yeah we there were two people at the retreat who had not had surgery what a beautiful extraordinary powerful blessing because I got to see what an unmutilated intersex body looks like. Um, so, you know, I've never been to a retreat again where we would do something like that. That's a very American thing. And I think most of us who are European would be aghast at the idea of taking off our clothes and showing each other their genitals. But it was beautiful. It was incredibly powerfully healing. Um, and very much in the time. And we have to remember this is going back nearly 25 years ago. Yeah, I think people often don't realize how young the intersex movement is. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, from what I understand, there, there, there were uh, events happening in Latin America around that time as well. But, but the ISNA retreat is the first known gathering of, of people ever. And, and as our stories come you know, more into public, it, it may be that it wasn't the first. And if it wasn't the first, it would be wonderful to learn about which, which was the first. But yes, that this is people putting their hands up um, and it is interesting, Morgan, that there was a critical mass. So these things were going on 
in Latin America, there was things going on in the UK, there was things going on up in Canada. I mean, Bonnie it was setting up an organization in Australia at around about the same time. And I'm fascinated by that. Like we weren't talking to each other and yet there was something going on about people finding their voices. Yeah, yeah. So that began your activism. Really, you, you came back from the US and you founded ITAMS. Yep, I put to use all that training that I'd had. So my education training, um, the work that I'd had in, in the civil defense, being trained as an executive manager um, and, and the experiences of, of retraining as a counselor psychotherapist. So. I drew on all those skills and all the networks and contacts that I had because I'd been a, a senior person in local government and yeah. yes, set up the organization that became ITANS. Yeah. So, I mean, do you see intersex led organizations uh, and intersex focused organizations as being important? Um, Oh, absolutely. So in the early days, um, people don't realize this, there were a couple of people who were intersex who were involved in ITANS in the very early years. But I came to realize that there's only a small group of us who are really interested in activism and social change, what we would call human rights. Um, the majority of the community are interested in, in support. Um, but not really involved in activism. So I did in the early years try and set up a support organization, but when we had real blood on the floor, I realized I didn't, I had the skills in terms of my own knowledge, but we didn't have the financial resources to put a, an appropriate um, safe support network. Now there's a, a saying in social work hurt people hurt people and you know we're we are a community of traumatized not everybody but the majority of our community have horror stories and until you know, we have done our own work and learn about our own story and how to be with other people and not be triggered and be safe so I have huge admiration for what it was that, that Bonnie and, and Phoebe and the people that worked in the early days set up that support organization in Australia because it's the longest duration peer support, you know, sustainable one that I know is AIS um, in America, but that, that's had multiple people run and organize that and you've got critical mass in America in terms of a numeric. Yeah. So I, I, and I think I'm interested in the fact that in Australia, you do have a support organization and then you have your organization, you know, that's doing the policy human rights work. Yes, uh, and that, that split has been helpful to us. Absolutely. But I should mention that, that people like Tony Griffer and Andy Hyder um, were, were very significantly involved in the development of what's now Intersex Peer Support Australia and what was originally the AIS Support Australia. So um, I, I want to acknowledge all the people that, that helped to found that organisation. So yeah, it, and I'm the, seeing some people yeah. you know, here tonight um, who have been part of the retreats and part of the organisation. So I see yeah. everyone who's been involved because what we have done down in this part of the world is pretty unique. It, it, it's not replicated to my knowledge anywhere else in terms of the number of retreats that we've been able to hold, you know, the, the genuine support and, and loving that goes on in this community. Yeah, I, well, I, I hope it goes on in, in other parts of the world. Um, and I see... Um, I think Euro thought. Europe has a very high functioning peer support um, group or groupings. I, I 
had the privilege of being the clinical support person for um, Interact's first youth retreat. And of course, they've gone on to have multiple events. So yes, but these things take resources. They, they require money. They require people who have the skills and training um, to organize and run. Yeah, and resourcing is one of the key constraints, I think, on, on this peer support work and on advocacy. But, but to, to my mind, both peer support and advocacy happen through a process of community development. I think of people mm -hmm. coming together yep. and, and sharing stories. There was, there was sharing. no money and budget in those days. No, people just gave very generously what they could and people managed with very little. Yeah. Yeah. So can you, 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 you maintained your role with, sorry, you mentioned you were a clinical support for Interact. In, Interact for people that don't know is a key advocacy organization in the US uh, for youth with intersex variations. Um, and that was set up by Anne Tamar Mattis, who you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. as being with you when the first retreat happened in 1997. Correct. So, so there's a kind of, is there kind of a serendipity in, in those relationships developing or, or is there a I, more... Absolutely. So, you know, I went to America. Um, it was seminal. It changed my life. And then I was fortunate enough to go, be able to go back multiple times. So I became a board member of you know what became interact because it was originally advocates for informed choice when it was first set up and then interact became two parts it became the adult part and then the it developed that incredible youth development program that has gone on to give us so many leaders um, in the intersex movement in, in america it really has been a program that has grown, supported, extended um, intersex advocacy enormously. And that, that was Anne's brainchild. And of course, Kimberly took that program over and then really it was run by the youth. So Pitch was the first person who was appointed um, to, to run that. And there have been multiple people since then. Pitch and Pagonis. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So we haven't had the scale in, in our part of the world to, to replicate that, but we have come together through a series of retreats and community events. So um, maybe now I'll become the questioner because I can talk to you about, you know, how we came to have the Darlington retreat and <laughs> you know, this extraordinary document that we have developed for this part of the world. Well, I mean, you were a part of that, I think. Um, yeah, but how it came to be, we, we had an LGBTI organisation that uffied and support us. They were in the background, they provided all the resourcing, the logistics, and, and they exemplified what an ally organisation could do. They, they were there in the background, they didn't drive it, but they supported us to do that first retreat in a very beautiful way. Yes, and, and I think a, a lot of thanks should go to the people that ran that organisation back then. At the time. Who, yeah, who um, are, are amazing people uh, and they're still doing uh, the work of, of an ally um, in, in helping grow peer support for, for our community. But um, yeah, Mani, you, you were at the meeting where we decided to hold the Darlington retreat. Mm -hmm. um, and then you were there. And there were, I think, over 30 people at the Darlington retreat, which, which made it one of the largest gatherings, I think, that we've had in Australia. And it was fantastic to have people from Aotearoa as well. Yeah. Um, we did construct a document, a statement of demands. 
Um, that's called the Darlington Statement, and it's available online. And, and anybody who's here, you, you can go and have a look at that. And you can also affirm it as well. And sign on as a, yeah, as a supporter, as an affirmer. I mean, I mean to my mind, I mean, I think that, that events like the Darlington Retreats both illustrate a moment in a, in a community development process, but they also create more opportunities for people to come together and mm -hmm. meet. Because having a shared reason to come together, I think, is really vitally important. Um, so can, we, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing in Aotearoa, New Zealand? Um, here in Australia, I think the advocacy work here has been focused on trying to get funding for peer support um, and trying to get funding for mental health support. But we've, we've used um, approaches available to avenues of, available to us, including a science inquiry on, on involuntary or co sterilization in 2013, the human rights inquiry uh, that reported just last year in, in 2021, uh, and some work with states and territories. But, but work has been going on in Aotearoa, New Zealand at the same time. And that's not been so visible to people here. So do you feel able to talk about the yeah, it's, it's not the sexy, exciting part of, of my work, but it is an important part. So um, I made the decision to focus on structural reform, realizing that if we could do that, then we wouldn't be continuing the model because the horrifying thing is even though 26 years ago we sat underneath a redwood tree and I believed, I, I thought we would go to doctors, we would tell them the terrible damage that they were doing and they would go, oh my God, you know, we're doing terrible damage and they would stop. Like, I truly believe that. Um, and thank goodness none of us realized that this was long haul work and just how deeply embedded the medical model is and how horrifically slow it would be to change you know and so 26 years has passed and children continue to have non-consensual surgeries done and bodies continue to be normalized and parents continue not to be supported so that's yeah. where a lot of my energy and focus has been. So we used, and again, through um, my, my, I became a member of ILGA and learning about processes. One of the things I learned about was the UN process. So I don't remember now, it's probably eight years ago that we made our submission to UNCROC. So UNCROC is a subcommittee of the UN, so United Nations Committee for the Rights of Children. And um, I co-wrote that, that submission with um, allies. I didn't have at the time any intersex people working with me. So we made a submission to UNCROC and UNCROC came back with some pretty heavy hitting recommendations, questions for our New Zealand government. Um, I made that submission with the New Zealand Human Rights Commission and for the Commission for Children in New Zealand. So I had two very powerful government agencies who were supporting me. So we came back um, that's a, that those reports came to central government. And then I worked with the New Zealand Human Rights Commission and we had three round tables. So these were um, round tables that involved intersex people, they involved medical people, they involved politicians, they involved nurses, they involved psychiatrists, they, they, they brought together a, um, a broad spectrum of people. And out of those meetings, um, 
our government committed to a, a process of working with doctors. Now, that process was um, confidential. The report that came out at the end of that, which was nearly three years long, it has remained confidential. It was a um, very difficult process to be involved in, but our current government was noticing what was going on and developed a manifesto for all rainbow rights, which included a desire to bring a human rights focused um, lens for the treatment of intersex children in Aotearoa. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Had it not been for COVID, that would have been pulled across the line and in place by now. My fear is we have a, an, an election next year in New Zealand and I don't know that we've got enough time to have that commitment embedded before an election, because if we get a conservative government, I absolutely know they will not continue the support. So we're, we're balanced at an incredibly delicate place um, where we both have to push what happens, but be beautifully nuanced because when you're working with structural government change it's quite a complex beast to understand you need to be patient respectful but very well informed and I and I know um, you Morgan and others are doing that same dance in Australia but yours is different because you do it at a state level rather than in New Zealand we we it's not a federal system, we, but we don't have a state system here. So, you know, we're on the edge of big change, but we haven't pulled it across the line yet. We, we definitely have commitment and a good understanding from this current government. Um, but, you know, these things take time. They, they as I say, great patience, um, humility, yeah, that sounds right. Um, we are still not, not across the line here either. Um, in the very near future, the ACT government will be the first to introduce exposure draft legislation to protect the human rights of people with innate variations of sex characteristics in medical settings. Um, and Victoria has also made commitments uh, for, for, to reform uh, and New South Wales has acknowledged those um, developments. But there's a lot of work that has to happen, I think, beyond legislation because... Um, oh, absolutely. That's why I came back to that point before around supporting parents. Yeah. Um, and unless we get real serious resourcing and, you know, the programme that Bonnie is working on at the moment, and I saw some posters about that this afternoon, if, if we could get something like that in place that was funded, then things would change overnight, irrespective of what doctors would do, because parents would be advocating for their children. And I know that most parents have no desire or intention to hurt their kids. And the majority of parents with information would not proceed with um, unnecessary surgeries. And they would have the resource and the capability to love their kids and support their children to be their beautiful, wonderful selves. Yeah, thank you. I think that, that the lack of resources accounts for a lot of harm. It, it also, I think, well, there's evidence to say that that lack of resourcing for mental health support is also a reason why surgeries happen. That there's an idea that that can fix a problem that, that then no longer people no longer require support because they have normalized children. Well, if the system listened to us, we would know that's absolutely bullshit, but it has been so hard to get our voice given the same authority as that of our doctors. Yeah. Yeah. So. Th that is true. So 
can we talk about the future then? I mean, I mean, um, there is a lot of work that still needs to take place. A lot of it is complex and nuanced. And can you can you talk about what you see as the priorities or, or what needs to change? I think we keep on doing with stubborn, fierce determination what we've been doing for twenty six years, and we build around us through collaborations, um, allies, because we can't do this work by ourselves. So um, we do have, there are not a lot of them, but we do have doctors who support us. They tend not to be the doctors who are specialists in our area, but we do have those people and we have them supporting and speaking up. We now, across both countries have senior politicians who are on our side. Um, I think we need um, human rights advocates, we need lawyers, um, judges, you know, we, we, we're talking about how you change in a system and I think that that's the other two things. So those of us who are working inside the system have to work with the system and then, you know, people who throw rocks and spray paint and do that other um, activist activity that who do artwork, who make films, all of that is important as well. Um, and we just need to know which lane we're in and, and what we're doing and how we behave in that particular lane. The other thing is that we carry on supporting and loving and caring about each other because those of us who are in the front line doing this work, it's hard. And it takes a toll and, and across the world, there's huge burnout with the frontline activists and the people doing the peer support work. So we need to build better toolboxes around, you know, how we do this work well and how we don't burn out and fall over and how we don't hurt each other or when we do hurt each other that we can learn how to say sorry and do the repair. But coming back to it, I, I think it's that fierce advocacy and <clears throat> we're not going to give up on second best. We know what we want and we will be around yelling, talking nicely, pleading, doing everything that we can until it's pulled across the line. And then central governments on both sides of the ditch need to do some repair work. So they need to say sorry to this community and then provide funding so that people can go off and do the healing work that's needed for each person. Thank you, Marnie. Um, that's a really articulate way of describing what has to happen for us as a, as a community and as a population. Um, can, you, can you tell us what you're going to do next? Because you, um, <laughs> you, you're, you're, yeah, you so are I, I mean, ITANS is no longer the right place for me to be. And that's what happens. Organizations shift and change and organizations' directions shift and change. So I, I've, you know, it wasn't working. It was taking a toll on me. And one of the things is, you know, I've got a good toolbox. So I knew that, um, I, I was being impacted by the stress, so it was time for me to pull the plug and change direction. So just today I found out I have a visa for America and in five weeks time I'm going off to the Ilga World Conference in Los Angeles. I haven't shifted out of my house for two years. I'm going to climb <laughs> on an airplane and go to America, but I will be doing that because there'll be 30 intersex people there and I will get to hang out. I'm not an executive director anymore. I can be silly, I can play, I can have fun and, and dream with the colleagues. Okay, what do we do next? How do we support each other for this you know, next part of this long haul project? How can we be sharing? And I know Morgan, you'll be there. So I, I think, People don't understand how important these literal coming together are and how we've been missing them through this COVID time where we haven't been able to get together, where we haven't been able to laugh, sing and dance together. 
you know, and it's taken a real toll on our communities. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we, Mani, I, I last saw you, I think, in January 2020, yeah, which and, was during, and, during the and bushfire. Mel in Melbourne at the conference. Yeah. yeah. And with the bushfire. So we were wearing masks, but for a different reason. So we wouldn't breathe in toxic smoke particles. Yeah. And I haven't met people I work with closely on a day to day basis, like Tony, like Bonnie, like Cody. Uh, some of them are here today. We, we haven't met face to face pretty much since then. Um, or many of us have not met face to face since then. because We've been in different parts of the country and it's a big country. So so when we get to meet, meet, meet each other again, I think it will really re-energize all of us. Um, yeah, so, so, so. And then yeah. as I said to you, um, it, it's been in my head for a, a long time. So the idea of writing a book um, and it was like, okay, this is the time to do that. And I want to acknowledge someone who's on the call tonight, Will Hansen, who is a um, history scholar. So we, we've been working together. Um, ITANS, of course, was set up as a paper organization. And the wonderful thing about that is we have a literal, it's about 17 year record of ITANS on paper, because that's how we operated, you know, with literal letters file cabinets remember that when <laughs> how offices used to be so that um archive needs to go into a safe place so the book project and then working on getting this extraordinary historical archive um completed and in a more secure place than it is at the moment which is just in the itans office and then the physical, unusual relics, our National Museum Te Papa has said that they are interested. So we'll, we'll be collecting, you know, I have, a, for example, the very first t-shirt that is not put out, which says hermaphrodites with attitude. So one of those, you know, there's various other artifacts across the years. And I like the idea of them going somewhere place so that, you know, a hundred years from now, people will go, oh, wow, those amazing hermaphrodite and the sexy people, look what they did. They were so brave. They were so colorful. They were so wonderful. They were so creative. They did all this with hardly anything. Yeah, well, Thank you for sharing that, Mani. And, and this has been a very colorful journey through your life and the work that you've been doing. Uh, I should mention that last year you became the first intersex activist to be awarded a Queen's Service Medal for intersex advocacy. So to That's see an intersex great. person acknowledged for intersex work is so rare and extraordinary. Um, and I know I, 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 at the time, I, we of course congratulated you for that. It's such an extraordinary achievement and, um, and, and so well deserved. So congratulations. I think that that um, really... Thank you, Morgan. I, I mean, I struggled to accept it because the whole sort of um, colonization, queens mm. and things, but then I realized actually this is the way this country and the same in, in your country does acknowledge what is called extraordinary service to the country and I thought this was an ex a way to both visibilize the issue but more importantly it was a, a way of me being able to thank all the amazing people who have collaborated and, and worked with me so there was an event at Government House. I was only able to take um, eight friends for that. But then we came back and had just the most wonderful afternoon at Dame Sparrow's, um, Margaret Sparrow's house, where people who had worked with me over the years came in and celebrated what we'd achieved together. Yeah. Um, thank you, Marnie. Thank you for your work and thank you for sharing today. Um, I'd like to ask, are there any questions or thoughts that 
Yeah, that would be nice before we, we end today. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you for this gentle walk through some parts of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marnie. Would anybody like to, uh, to, to make a comment or, or ask a question? You, you can use the chat function or, or you can take your mic off mute and... and and yeah, um, yeah, I'd like to say thank you so much, Marnie, for, for um, Hi, Sandra. what you shared today. Hi, um, it was really inspiring. And, um, you know, we live for these little um, Zoom catch ups, but they're really nice. And, and this was a special one. So I've got to learn a bit about your story. Um, and I'd love to know actually what you feel as a community, what do you think we need to be focusing on right now, like as far as getting. Um, moving forward and just um, having more more of us involved because we're such a small community and I keep feeling like there's a whole lot of people out there that we're just not reaching and I get a bit um, frustrated with that. Yeah, I think in this post-COVID era, and we're not there yet, um, we will get back to doing what we were doing. So we were meeting regularly in Australia and we were building the community yeah. base and we were, you know, through the training and we were doing those combined trainings. So the IPSA and HERA yeah. training together and again, bringing in outside experts to um, increase our toolboxes. So, I think we get back to doing that. And then, as I say, there's the split. So there's the political work that needs to go on. And that's not everybody's thing. And I think we need to say that. And then there's the community support work. And I think that's a different skill set. And um, again, we need better support so that the people doing that have good supervision, good backup. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we and we meet regularly so that we can support each other. So when you're working with someone who's in a really bad space, it, it, it's like a, a counsellor, you know, th th that takes a toll. And, and we need to make sure when people are doing that hard work that they have good backup and support. So Morgan was saying before it comes back, that there's a lot we can do by ourselves, but you, you reach a point where, where we actually need the word here in New Zealand is putia. We need money to take that next yeah. step. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And, and yeah. we just need to, you know, remind each other, God, we're amazing. We're doing extraordinary <laughs> things. And we, I don't know that we do that often enough. You know, we get out there and we do the work and we yeah. need to sometimes pause and have fun. And, um, you know, which yeah. we're pretty good at doing. And, and when we do get together, we do remember how to laugh and how to cry. And yeah. <laughs> Mani, I've, I've got a question from Joe Russell, uh, and then we'll go to Cody. Okay. Um, so Joe uh, says that she can't, sorry, I, I could be presuming your pronoun. Joe, you say you can't unmute, but you're a therapist in the UK working extensively with LGBTQ folks. Uh, Joe is not aware of ever having worked with an intersex client. How can Joe make uh, their services more accessible for people wanting support and how can Joe learn about how best to support them? So there's an organisation in um, the UK called Pink Therapy. So some of the people involved in Pink Therapy have been to Aotearoa and done a little bit of work with me. So there is some knowledge and awareness. I am myself a therapist and I'm always happy to provide um, brief supervision support so you know if you are going to do this work and say that you are willing to be a therapist doing intersex work you have to be ready to do your own work because you are going to be doing trauma work you are going to do work that will um, melt your feet so the other thing you would need is really, really good supervision and support. And yes, we need more competent therapists working to support our community and family. If I may, if I can add a couple of comments to that, and thanks for that, Marnie. Um, 
uh, I think that there is a new organization in the UK that, that people there can reach out to called Interconnected um, or ICON UK. And I'm just going to share their, their, um, their web address in the chat. Um, so they're, they're a new charity uh, in the UK who, who are supporting people with intersex variations. Um, and the, and the they, course is all the amazing work and writing of Katrina Rowan, who is a yeah. New Zealander, but who lived in the UK for 25 years. So there's all, she's a, um, an academic. Yeah, Katrina is now at Waikato University. Yeah. And yes, her work is really valuable. There's also Lee Mei Lau, who, yeah. who is a trustee of, of uh, Interconnected UK. So I think that's a really important, um, vital uh, connection as well. But I, I, I would also add that, that respecting a diversity of language that people might use mm. uh, is important because the different people are familiar with different, ter different terminology. Often people, you know, initially we use very medicalized terminology because it's what we're taught. It's how we're educated by, by doctors and by our parents. Um, um, so re respecting the language choices that people have. And, and the diversity, Morgan, of our community, because it's not yeah. one size fits all. We're an incredibly diverse uh, community. Yes. So, uh, Cody, you are next, and then we'll go to Maker, uh, who has a comment or question. Thank, about thank you, Joe, for that. And if you reach out to Morgan, Morgan will share my email address. Yeah. Hi, Cody. That. There we go. Even even I get caught off by mute sometimes. Um, <laughs> so I guess like a little bit um, of. Uh, my history with you was when I first approached the intersex community, um, I sort of butted heads with it, largely because I co was connected to a queer community in Canberra first, mm -hmm. and I didn't know how to talk about my intersex experience in anything other than queer terms. And when we first met at that first Darlington retreat was the first time where I genuinely felt like um, not only just connected to a community, but connected to um like uh politics that was larger than me that was the first time i felt like um like i i really needed to step up and like um be as much as i can be for my community and um like i i've always really appreciated um what you're um like um you as a role model uh there but i guess like to to take this to a question is that um mindful of those experiences I've always been really conscious of gatekeeping in our community and I'm just mm -hmm. what do you think about how do we bring more people on board in a way where we're being safe around the intersex community and their sensitivities but also in a way where we're not turning people away based on their eccentricities yeah, so it's how to create a, a safe, non-judging, very diverse space, um, because you're absolutely right. So, and, and this, we haven't talked about this tonight, so that might be an important point for non-intersex people. So within our community, we have people who um, would see themselves as cis and heterosexual. There are people who would see themselves um, it's queer identified, there are people who would see themselves as transgender, there are people who would see themselves as non-binary, and then probably a thousand things on top of that. So this community is diverse, and the only thing that unifies us as a community, and it does all around the world, is the horrific experiences that we have with the medical profession which awfully are universal around the world it pretty much doesn't matter which country you live in you get the same awful experience and so it's meant that this very diverse 
very different community has come together. And, and in the early days, we didn't do that well. We did it quite badly, but we have learned how to work together and, and we have identified the things that we agree on that need to be changed. And again, there's, there's a consensus around that around the world. So yeah, I think Cody, we just have to go back and keep asking ourselves, you know, that question, are, are we all at the table? And we know right now that we're not all at the table. So what do we need to do to bring um, people with disability, people of colour, people for whom English is not their first spoken language? And I'm just talking about the situation here in New Zealand and Aotearoa. So you know, there's, there's more work to do. The table is more diverse than when I first started, but it, it, we do not yet have everyone at the table. Does that answer your question? Um, that's fantastic. <laughs> I always <laughs> love listening to you speak. Thank you. Thank you for setting up and organizing this talk. And um, Maker has a comment question uh, in the chat and it's a bit confronting um so maker had, has had an experience as a nurse taking care of a kid who's just had surgery um and maker hadn't met the kid or family prior to surgery the kid was in pain and the parent was concerned about the pain uh, i felt like it wasn't the right time Maker says to have a conversation about how the surgery wasn't necessary. Um, I, I feel like, well, Maker says, I feel like I'm not sure how to have that conversation with parents or family members at work when, when, she, when Maker often meets them directly post surgery and there's lots of active trauma. So Maker's asking Mani if you have any suggestions that situation. Maker, you are, are in a horrific situation because you clearly have awareness and, and yet in, in the current model you have no power. But what that um, in pain, confused, damaged person needs is your love and your care. And if you can open your intuition and listen to what the child is asking needing so I would be led very much by the child but you know if they're asking what has happened to me you know what's going on and using all those beautiful nursing skills that you have to at least be honest without betraying the parents um, I know that whatever you do will be remembered by that child because at some point they're going to have to put all this together and make sense of it themselves and if they can remember someone who was kind and gentle and who listened to them that will be the most important thing thank you Marnie. and then hopefully your skills will be used by the adults who choose to have surgery because some of us will choose as adults to have surgery and then we absolutely need the most perfect nursing care in those situations. Um, a beautiful question. And yes, you're in a horrif horrified, horrifying situation which nurses should never be in. Yeah. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, thank you, Maker, as well, for the question. Yeah. Uh, are there any more kind of questions or comments? I mean, what I want to say, because, you know, we, we've been fairly gentle, but what we've been talking about today is brutal. So I'm going to imagine there will be people tonight who have been triggered, who feel sad, who feel all sorts of things. So please look after yourself wherever you are in, in the world and, you know, reach out, either reach out to us or reach out to a friend and talk about, you know, what this was like, what's going on for you. Don't hold it inside if you can. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marnie, for, for a wonderful evening together. Um, and thank you for telling, thank you for telling your story. And, and thank you for challenging us with ideas about what has to happen and what is needed. Um, 
I want to thank everybody that was here for, for listening and for asking questions. Um, and um, please do look after yourselves after the session. And, um, you know, I, I hope that you might reach out to Mani or to ITANS or to IPSA or ERA in Australia or Agenda Agenda as well. Um, and I hope that you might support the work that has to happen uh, in our countries as well. Uh, and I hope that you might come along to more webinars where, where uh, different people will be uh, speaking on, on um, issues of importance or personal stories. Uh, and there'll be many more of these through the year. And Thank maybe you. Morgan, the one person we missed out is, is the work that Bonnie's doing. So there's going to be all these new wonderful resources and we are, well not we, because it's Bonnie doing the work, is developing this very powerful resource, which if it was in place, then Mika would never have to ask that question as a nurse. Uh, look, this is really timely. Um, yeah. Um, Bob Bonnie is leading a, a pilot peer support project in Queensland called iLink uh, and Bonnie has just shared the link in chat and thank you for doing that Bonnie. Um, it, it, it is a really important project. I think are people, a, people able to sign up to that from today? Um, it's called Interlink. If you're in Queensland you can sign up to um, join the project. I think this Bonnie is your chance to spruik um, interlink, Bonnie. <laughs> Get plugging. Thanks so much, um, Marnie and Morgan, for a, a great organizing a great evening of um, intersex storing and um, looking backwards and looking forwards. It's really important to take the time to recognize where we've come because so much of the script about being intersex is still unknown to so many. So. Um, uh, my name's Bonnie Hart. I'm an intersex woman. I have a history of uh, running peer support in Australia. Um, and the project I'm working on at the moment is called Interlink. It's a new psychosocial support model that brings together mental health workers and peer workers to, to co-deliver um, uh, brief therapeutic fruit work with um, intersex people and the parents of intersex children. Um, it's just launching right now to possibly like um uh if you click on the link of i i net uh, ilink.net.au you might be some of the first people to see the website um but we're now accepting registrations um predominantly for people in queensland uh at the moment because it's being piloted by the queensland council for lgbti health um so pilot programs hopefully we'll get some good data that will prove it as an, a robust model um, and it really does function as like a, ref a referral pathway where people can come into a mutual space, get access to an educated mental health worker that they don't have to explain what intersex is to time again before they access um, support. Uh, they also get to connect with a peer worker who is connected to peer networks and has a listing of affirmative healthcare services and specialists. But then they'll also get to just see and meet other people as well. Um, and considering so many people with intersex variations have been told that they're the only one, have never really had an opportunity to meet another person and, and parents as well who have all gone through this um, decision-making process and journey, often in complete isolation. Um, get the opportunity to sit together and actually start conversations about intersex. I hope, Bonnie, we might get you back to talk about this in a webinar. Yeah. On the spot. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to, like, it'd be great. Um, but uh, yeah, please share the link with anyone that you think might be interested in attending. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about it. It's uh, built on the backs of many intersex peers that have done work um, kind of cultivating the ground so that there's an appetite for this, um, for this work to even, you know, get some traction and get up. Thank you, Bonnie.
Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful evening. I hope that you've uh, found it a, a really enjoyable experience as well as enlightening. And um, it'll be online uh, all being well within the week. One last question from Nat there. Oh, sorry. From a question from Matt. Oh, Nat. Nat. Hi, Nat. It's for me. Hi. It's oh. Ken people from Northern New South Wales join in. Oh. Um, I can't see a problem with that. The first few sessions will be delivered via Zoom. Um, so I think we're a bit more flexible. But beyond that, Interlink will um, be run in person as well in Southeast Queensland in at Brisbane. So. Um, that's the current, to do some commuting. Yeah, that's the current <laughs> state of affairs, but it's a pilot model. So hopefully the model itself um, with the right amount of interest can be disseminated to different jurisdictions around the place as well. That's the, that's the hope. Little imaginary line that separates us. <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> which has become very tangible in the last <laughs> two years. Hasn't it yeah. just? Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so that. much, Morgan. Um, it's been a delightful, wonderful night, and it just reminds me you know, of our extraordinary community, where we've come from, where we're going. So thank you for making this opportunity. Um, and let's COVID roll past so that we can get to being human and meeting again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you, Marnie. Thanks, Morgan. And thank you.